Good morning and welcome to Lost River Bethany Mennonite uh, Church's Sunday morning service in, uh, in isolation, I guess. And um, thank you for, for joining us. I guess while we're kind of isolating and stuff, I want to encourage you guys to be reading your Bible, be praying. And use this time <clears throat> to walk closer to the Lord. Use this time to set good patterns with the Lord, right? Um, you know, we have time now. We have more time in these days, most of us. So let us not just be going through our daily bread. Let us be, you know, uh, ripping into two or three chapters of the Word of God every day. Uh, let's be studying it. Let's be, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out, ask ourselves, okay, what is this teaching us about God? What is this teaching us about Jesus? What does this passage teach about me? And, and what do I need to change? What do I need to, what do I need to give up to Jesus? What do, I need to, uh, what do I need to listen to here? What is he trying to tell me here, right? So let's be in our word. I want to encourage you guys to be in your word in this time. I want to also encourage you guys to be praying. Um, be praying about what's going on in the world today. And, and, and shortly here we'll, we'll open in prayer and then I'll jump into the, to the message. But <clears throat> I want to encourage you guys to, to be at prayer. Be praying for those that are impacted uh, by, by the coronavirus, and, and there's literally hundreds of thousands of people uh, that are impacted. Be praying for them, be praying for their family, be praying for uh, the believers in Jesus Christ that have been in, impacted in their families, even those that have died and, and have gone to sleep uh, to, be, to be with the Lord. Uh, but also be, with, uh, be praying for those that have been impacted and that God wants to use this experience to, to bring them closer to Himself. Um, so, so let's be at prayer, guys. Let's be, let's using this time to be reading, to be praying, to be growing in Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple announcements. I just want to encourage you guys, the new Daily Breads are here. So, uh, the church has been, um, I've been at the church, uh, quite a bit. So, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm here. Um, and so be, uh, if you guys want to grab, uh, one of those, um, just come to the church, grab one. I've been, We've been careful not to touch anything. Uh, we'll keep our social distance, and uh, you can come grab that. Uh, also, I wanted to encourage you guys, if you're looking for a place to kind of experience a full service, so there's worship and, and, and everything kind of put together, uh, I haven't been brave enough to, to do a worship service by myself or with my family here. So uh, if you want to have kind of that whole uh, church service experience online, um, uh, the church in Regina, called Hillsdale uh, Baptist Church, um, Hillsdale Church. Uh, they have invited us to be a part of their service online for that whole thing. So I've put a link to that uh, just in the button actually below the video. So if you're looking for kind of a whole service, you can, you can uh, make use of that. I would encourage you to do that uh, and, and worship with them, sing some songs with them. Uh, and I would, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, that said, I also wanted to make mention of um, <clears throat> the... Uh, leadership stuff. I'm sorry this week I was not able to get um, a leadership uh, thoughts from the pastor leadership second out next week. I'll get out two. I'm just about done editing one of them and then I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll have time this next week here to, to pop out another one. And I pray that that's encouraging you and that's helping you. Let's open in prayer. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for your grace and your truth and your love. God, we thank you that you are a good God, that you are present. And I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit spirit by the by the power of the holy spirit and by your authority lord jesus that that you have in heaven and on earth that you would speak through me that you would guide my words that you would be in this time lord god that you would quiet our hearts you would quiet our hearts lord god and that we would we would just know and feel like you are present I pray for those listening, Lord, and watching. I pray that they would just know that your presence is near. Lord God, I just pray that we'd be impacting this world for your kingdom and for your glory. Lord God, I just pray that you would protect us from the demonic forces of evil. Protect us, Lord, especially those of us are, that are out there, Lord God, that are, are isolating alone. God, I just pray that you would just protect us from the demonic forces of discouragement and depression and, and uh, feeling lonely, Lord God. May we just embrace each other. Uh, may there be good conversations on the phone and on Facebook and, Lord, just even listening to good messages on, online and stuff. And, God, that there would still be a, a strong connection to you above all else. But this time would just draw us into having a really close and a powerful relationship with you. God, that we would know, that we would be still and know, Jesus, that you are in this room, 
that you are with us, that you live within us by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that you are alive in us, that we are not alone, that the God of the universe is within and around and is in control. And so, Lord God, I just pray that this morning that despite our, um, maybe our loneliness or our, our, our um, anxieties and our fears, Lord God, that we would just lay them at your feet. God, we just give them to you and we pray that you would be a part of this time, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for those families impacted by the, by the, the, by the coronavirus, by this pandemic. God, I pray that you would bring comfort to those that have lost loved ones. God, you can use this to bring around your, your purposes. And I pray, Lord God, that you would. Pray. God, I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would give us uh, love for these people, that we would act, that we would act as you would act, that you would lay it on our heart what to do, especially in this time when we're not, we can't just do the normal things, that you give us wisdom to know how to encourage those around us, Lord, that are struggling with fear and anxiety, Lord, that are struggling with the idea that they could die and that this is their, life is their hope. Life is what they have. They don't know you. They don't know the, the goodness of uh, being able to just come uh, and, and, and to be with you and to know, Lord God, that if, if you took my life today, I would be with you. And so come, Lord Jesus. They don't know that, Lord God. So I pray that our hearts would, we would have empathy for those around that are living in fear that we would not be foolish in, in, in our fearlessness of death. God, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, and then as our neighbor struggles and fears, God, that that would bother us greatly. And then, Lord God, that you would, know, you would give us wisdom to know how to impact them, even though that there is a distance between us. Use this time, Lord. Use this time for your kingdom. Bring comfort to the hearts of those that, are, that have lost loved ones, and be with your people, Lord, to know how to comfort them. God, I just pray that you'd be in my words, that this would bring you glory. Lord, that on this day, Lord, uh, on this Sunday, Father, that, that we would just rest in you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and risen and present Savior, we pray these things. Amen. So three questions that I, uh, had you, uh, that I asked you last week, and I pray that you were thinking about them the, throughout the week, and I pray that they came to mind throughout the week. But the three questions were this. And what am I trying to prove myself? Where in my life am I making my own bread? And am I listening to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? We've been looking at in the last couple of weeks uh, the, the, the topic of discipleship. And we've been looking at um, the, the Great Commission. The Great Commission where uh, Jesus uh, talks to his disciples and then sends them out, gives them the mission that he gives uh, his disciples, his followers. And, uh, this is, and, and we've been looking at really the first four verses, the uh, first four words, forgive me, uh, of um, kind of the context and where we find the Great Commission. And this is the context. Um, uh, we, let, let's just read that, that passage. It starts in 16 and it says this, Then the eleven disciples, and that's kind of where we stopped, right there, boom. Then the eleven disciples, I'm going to read you the whole passage though, went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's very important for us to make sure that that we're, sorry, that we're one of the 11. It's very important because if we go and start making disciples, we want to make sure that we're making disciples that, that are following Jesus, that are listening to the Father, that aren't making their own bread, that aren't um, trying to prove themselves and prove their worth, that are listening to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that are living their lives knowing Jesus and doing the will of the Father. That's why we need to make sure that we pay attention to this warning. And so then we were looking at Judas's life last week, recognizing that Judas missed Easter. He was a, he was a disciple of Jesus that looked like Jesus, uh, sorry, that, that looked like a disciple of Jesus, that sounded like a disciple of Jesus, that acted like a disciple of Jesus, that the other disciples saw as, you know, a solid disciple of Jesus, but yet he misses Easter. He betrays Jesus for money, for his own purposes, 
We looked at Jesus' words of warning about not missing it in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. And I'm just going to read that quickly. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do, do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. And in seeing that Satan was very much a part of Judas's last days and a part of uh, Judas's betrayal of Jesus, we stopped and took some time, and we'll do that again today, and looked at uh, Satan's involvement with, with Jesus and how Satan tries to tempt Jesus because we recognize that Satan's temptation of Jesus is Satan using his best temptations against man. And that those are the same things that he tempts us with. And likely the same things that he tempted Judas with. Now, we don't know exactly what was going on in Judas's mind, but we see through this, the temptation of Jesus some of the things that are likely to have happened in Judas's heart and mind. Satan knows man's heart, and Satan has been tempting man for thousands of years. Satan threw his best temptations at Jesus. The temptation Satan knows man struggles with most and will fall most easily too. So, and I asked you guys last week, in, in, am I trying, first of all, to prove myself? To ask yourself that, to think about that. Are you trying to prove yourself? In what areas do you try to prove yourself? To ask yourself, where in your life are you making bread? Where are you trying to provide for yourself, your way, your time, and your ability, without seeking the Lord first? And lastly, are you listening to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? And this is where we pick up today, going into the second, going into the second temptation. I just want to read that, that whole temptation passage. So we're going to read uh, Matthew 4 to 11, and it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are, prove yourself. Make this bread provide for yourself. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels to concerning you, and they will lift you up on their hands, so that you will not strike your, your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship your, the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. So we're jumping into here. We're going to jump into verse 5 here, the second temptation. So we see here that, Jesus, that Satan once again says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, um, to, to, to prove yourself, this topic of proving yourself and, and the self-identity, self-perspective per, um, that I am right and that I am good and I am even great and I am worthy to be loved and, and I am worthy to be listened to. People should listen to me. I, I have a voice. People should listen. And our great need to prove it. They're like, you know, and, and we all have our different ways of, of, and areas of what we want to prove. But this idea of proving yourself is in two of them temptations that Satan throws at Jesus. And so it is a very important aspect of man's temptation to walk away from God. And if you're sitting there listening and thinking, no, well, I don't struggle with proving myself. You're only deceiving yourself. And you're the only person that looks at your life and goes, yep, there's no place that you're trying to prove yourself. Everyone else around you sees areas where you're trying to prove yourself. I can imagine that the, 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 you guys as a congregation, right? You guys don't know me very long, but I bet you those that know me a little bit better know that there's areas where I'm, I want to prove myself. I'm sure there's areas where, and, and I'm, I'm, there are areas that I struggle to, to, to just trust the Lord and not prove myself, right? 
There, it, all of us have that. All of us have that. So yes, we all struggle with this trying to prove ourselves, and Satan knows it's one of man's greatest weaknesses. We all want to prove that we are valuable and acceptable, wise and worthy, that we are good. This goes back to the, to the Garden, of, good, uh, the Garden of, 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 of Eden and that understanding of what is good and evil. And we want people to see us as good and we want to hide what we see as evil. We all want and desire, so to speak, our 15 minutes of fame. We love when people tell us that we are loved or that we did a good job. We, always, we love people patting us on the back and saying, you're amazing, well done. Right? We want people to love us. And even those who struggle with self-esteem and feel like we're not good enough, we still, all of us, love it when people love us. Even people who struggle with, with low self-esteem long for people to love them and accept them. We all want to prove that we are worthy. And so we, you, no matter your age or your culture, it is just a logical, natural thing. In fact, I think it's so natural that we long for this, that is a part of our nature, that, that oftentimes we don't even think about it and we don't really pay attention to it, but we do it. But we do it. So Satan says in the first temptation, prove yourself. And he says again in, your, in the second temptation, prove yourself. Satan takes Jesus to a high place in Jerusalem. And again, we hear Satan's call for Jesus to prove himself. But note the difference of the temptation here. Satan is not calling Jesus to prove himself by his own abilities in this, in this one. Okay? He's calling him to prove himself by doing godly things to make himself acceptable, to prove that he's the son of God by doing godly things, by putting God to the test. Prove yourself by God's way. Now this is, a, and that's how I'm going um, to word it, because in the first temptation, Satan says, prove yourself your way, right? And the second temptation here, Satan's basically saying, prove yourself God's way. Prove yourself God's way. Still on your strength and your ability, but doing God's stuff. God's stuff. Satan is tempting Jesus once again to prove himself, but he is calling Jesus to prove himself by doing the things that God has said he would do by testing God. Jesus says, it is written, thou shalt not put the Lord God to the test. I believe that this isn't so much about testing God's willingness to act, to, uh, to, to protect Jesus. This isn't about testing God in relation to, will God be honest about what he said? That's not the test. Jesus, um, to act on his word, Jesus and Satan both know that God does not lie. God will act. God will fulfill his promises. And that God will do as he promised. Amen. But more so, I believe, again, that Jesus is speaking... Um, Sorry, Satan is speaking to uh, the idea of testing God by engaging in actions that are God-spoken, God-ordained, that are in line with God's word, but engaging in them only to prove yourself, to prove you're worthy, to manipulate God into doing what you want him to do for your own purposes. Think about it. God doesn't need to know if Jesus is the Son of God. God doesn't need to know that. So, so Jesus going, okay, God, if I'm the Son of God, okay, if I'm the Son of God, and, and, you know, let's check this out, okay? Let's test, right? And to jump off. And, 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 and so God doesn't need to know. God already knows Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus, if Jesus tr truly trusts the Father, who has already told him, you are my son, in you am I, I love you, and in you I am well pleased. If Jesus truly trusts the Father, then he doesn't need to prove himself to Satan either. He doesn't, Jesus doesn't need to prove himself to himself. He's not, he doesn't need to. If he truly trusts the Father, he's not like, so am I the son of God? He doesn't, he doesn't need to, to prove himself. And he doesn't need to prove himself to others. 
because he trusts the God. He trusts the Father. Think about it. What did Jesus do just before he went out into the, the wilderness to be tempted? What, it, what had just happened? Let's read in Matthew. So Matthew 4, Matthew 4 starts off with Jesus' temptation. But what happened in Matthew 3, you know, uh, Matthew 3, just before? Listen to this. Matthew 3, 13. So this is what happened just before he went out to get tempted, okay? Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to de uh, de deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for me to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John con uh, consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened. Okay, this is Matthew 3, 16. And when he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and... Um, alighting on him, landing on him, resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son. A voice from heaven. This is my son, in whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus already knows. If he trusts the Father's word, Jesus already knows. I am the son of God because the voice from heaven, God said, This is my son. He already knows that he is loved. Why? Because the voice from heaven, the Father, God, said, I love him. And he already knows that what he's doing is accepted by God. And how does he know that? Because the voice of from heaven, the Father, God, said, I am well pleased in you. So here we're standing at the second temptation. And Satan says, prove yourself, go over. Now if Jesus trusts the Father. He doesn't need to prove anything. He already knows, and he's heard it from God the Father himself. I love it. Don't miss it here. I love it that Jesus goes into the wilderness and fasts, fasts for 40 days. I love that. You know why? Because I, it connects to the 40 years of, the, of, 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 of Moses in the wilderness with the Israelites. There's a connection there. And in this moment, especially at this temptation, okay, you see this connection of the 40. And 40 days ago, 40 days ago, Jesus just came out of the water and God said, you are my son, I love you, I am well pleased with you. Boom. 40 days later, Jesus has, has fasted you know what's awesome about Jesus? He doesn't need to hear it again. The amazing thing about Jesus is that 40 days later, he doesn't need to hear it again. How different is that to us? And how different that was to the Israelites? And I've, I've shared this with you guys before. And uh, this story here in Exodus 14, we know that Israel is going across the Red Sea and, uh, and God parts the waters. And then uh, once they get to the other side, God brings the waters back and kills, uh, wipes out basically the entire Egyptian army. And then they praise and they celebrate. And chapter 15, we have this verses 1 to, um, verses 1 to 21, we have this great song and this celebration where they're singing. And then after they finish singing, we get into 21, and I mean, sorry, to 22, and it says this, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went to the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. That doesn't mean that they didn't have water, right? That they just didn't find a new spring of water. When they came to uh, Mer Merah, when they came to Merah, they could not drink the water because it was bitter. That is why they call it Merah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Right? They start grumbling against Moses again. Why aren't you providing? Why, what's going on here? So how long did it take them to not trust in God, that God was going to provide for them? They just saw the Red Sea split. They just crossed it on dry land. 
They just saw the enemy that was going to kill them destroyed by the water. And how long before they start going, well, what are you going to do? Well, are we going to die? Oh, well, what's happening? Why would you do this? Three days. Three days later, they didn't trust that God was going to provide, that God was going to protect, that God was leading them, and he knows what he was doing. Three days. Three days. Forty days later, Jesus fasting. Forty days later. And I mean, so, I, and I say the 40 years. Read through this passage of their time. It's again and again and again. Day, couple weeks, couple months. And they're, they're complaining again. They don't trust God. They're worried that he's, he's not going to provide for them. Forty days, Jesus being tempted to prove himself. He says, no. Thou shall, uh, you won't test. You don't need, no, we don't need to test God. The word of God says, you shall not test the Lord your God. No, he will not test the Lord because he knows he is God's son. And that God's told him that. And he knows that God loves them because God's told him that. And he does not need to test God because he knows that he is, God is pleased with him because God has already told him that. And 40 days later, that is still true. And God doesn't need to tell him every day that. Jesus heard it from God and he knows it's true. And it continues to be true 40 days later. This is beautiful. But, and it's something that we need to, 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 to recognize in our own lives I don't need to prove myself. I don't need to test God. I know who he says I am. I need to believe it. I don't need to prove myself. I don't need to test God. I know that he loves me because he says he loves me. I don't need to prove myself. I don't need to test God because I know that he is pleased in me through Jesus Christ. Because he says he is pleased in me through Jesus Christ. I am a new creation, a child of the king. That is who God says I am. How are you doing at having faith in who God says you are? That you are a child of the king if you know Jesus Christ. That he loves you and that he is in Christ pleased with you. Do you believe that? Or do you struggle with believing that every couple days, every couple days, every couple days, like the Israelites? This is a beautiful thing to see. But note there is also something else going on in this temptation. Note how Satan is trying to make the temptation okay and even godly things. He's trying to make the temptation. Satan's, he's, he's coy here. He's using scripture and godly things to try to tempt Jesus to prove himself. So there's a second part, there's a second kind of uh, um, thought in this temptation. Guys, note this temptation carefully because it's one of Satan's greatest deceptions. It is one of the greatest struggles that man has to prove that they are lovable, to prove that they are good, that they are accepted, and to get what they want because they are doing the good things that God has told them to do. It is almost like Satan is saying, now hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me at this. This is so important. Satan is saying, you know God said that if you do this, then he will do that. Right? Making a barter with God. God said that if you do this, then he'll do that. Satan is saying, if you do this thing that God said, then he'll have to do this for you. If you do this for God then he'll have to do this for you. So prove yourself by doing this for God, and then God will have to do that for you. People have always tried to do, to act, to prove themselves by doing the things of God, to doing the things that God has said to do, in order for them to prove that they deserve something from from God. Note the passage of Scripture that we had already looked at this morning. When Jesus is speaking of the warning about people who look like disciples and act like, like, like disciples, but yet miss it. Let's just read that again. Matthew, this, this is the, the second temptation is speaking so, so closely connected 
to Matthew 7, 21, which we've looked at already, right? Where it says this, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then he will tell them plainly. Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus says. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So the point is, are they doing God kind of stuff? Yes. And why are they doing it? It's obvious that they're doing it because they want to get into heaven. I am doing godly things so that God has to do this. I am doing godly things so that God has to give me this. That is the heart of this temptation. Prove yourself by doing this and then God will have to do that. And lots of people today and all the way through history have been engaged in trying to test God in this manner. They're trying to prove themselves that they're worthy of heaven by doing the things that God has asked his people to do, believers to do, disciples to do. They have fallen into temptation that Satan is in our passage trying to tempt Jesus with. Prove yourself. Prove who you are in God. Who you are in God. If you're the son of God. If you're a believer of Jesus. And prove that you should be loved by God and that he is pleased with you by doing the stuff that he has told his children in scripture to do. Prove yourself on your own strength but do it by doing the godly things God has said to do in his word. So the first temptation, Satan tempts Jesus to prove himself by providing for himself his way. The second temptation, uh, Jesus, uh, Satan tempts Jesus sorry, to prove himself by, um, by providing for himself God's way. Providing for himself God's way. But Jesus trusted in God's timing and in God's provision. Jesus also trusted that he was who God said he was, the Son of God. And that God loved him and was still pleased with him. And he didn't need to, to prove to himself or to Satan anything. Guys, how are you doing at not proving yourself? This, is, this was one of Satan's chief temptations um, I'm not saying that you don't need to be worried about being engaged in doing godly things. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not letting you off the hook here. But what I am saying that if you are going to church and you are going to Bible study and if you are reading your daily bread and reading the scripture and praying, if you're doing those things because you think, well, because I do these, God will let me into heaven because that's what being a Christian is about. You're missing it. That's not what being a Christian is about. Now, should you be reading your, the, the Bible? Yes. Should you be uh, praying? Yes. Should you be reading daily bread and, and being engaged in fellowship and going to church? And should you be casting out demons and doing miracles and prophesying in Jesus' name? Yes. And should you be telling your neighbor about Jesus? Yes, you should be. Yes, you should be. But that's not how you get into heaven. Listen to Ephesians 2, uh, 10. Actually, no, you know what? I'm going to start in maybe eight here, I think. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. So you've been saved by grace through faith, and it's not you. And it's not the things you've done that's going to save you. Will we cast out demons in your name? Will we prophesy in your name? No, 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 that's not going to save you. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, but it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. So this is the next pet sentence, though. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So should we be doing good works? Absolutely. But why? Because God of the universe and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit live in us and their love for others lives in us and their love to proclaim uh, love and grace and kindness their desire to save the whole world lives in us so should we be doing miracles for others so that that they can um you know um that they can uh 
come into the grace and into the kindness of Jesus Christ? Absolutely. And should we be casting out demons so that they can find freedom, spiritual freedom? Absolutely. And should we be prophesying so that the secrets, uh, Corinthians, right, for the secrets of, their, uh, of people's hearts can be laid bare and they might know that God is in this place? right? Absolutely. But we do it not because we try to, because we do that, then God, you have to do this. No, 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 no. And we don't need to prove ourselves. That's why we don't do it. We don't need to speak in tongues to prove our salvation. We don't need to prophesy to prove our salvation. We don't need to preach to prove our salvation. We don't even need to disciple to prove our salvation. We disciple and we preach and we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those that are gifted with tongues speak in tongues uh, uh, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we prophesy for those that have the gift of prophecy to, to show people the secrets of their hearts so that they know that God is in the place. Why? So that we can reach the lost and save people and bring them into an eternity with our Jesus who loves us and loves them. That's why we do it. Our salvation? Our salvation is by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. In the same way, guys, we need to live our lives like Jesus did, trusting that we are who we said we are, who he says we are. Trusting that he loves us because he's told us he has loved us. And trusting that he accepts us in Jesus Christ because God has told us he accepts us in Jesus Christ. And then being filled with Jesus' love, go do all those things. Do the will of the Father, right? Because Jesus, um, Jesus says, but only those that do the will of the Father. He says that in Matthew 21 at the second part there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And we do the will of the Father by listening to the will of the Father through Jesus Christ and, and, and uh, who we are connected to by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so we live a life being compelled, compelled by God's love to prophesy and to preach, and to disciple, because that is what we're called to do, and that is what we long to do, because we love God and we love others. So Satan, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Thou shall not test the Lord your God. The second temptation was for Jesus to prove himself and to test God by doing things God's way prove himself by doing things God's way. But Jesus trusted in God's timing, in God's provision, and Jesus trusted in God's words. He knew who he was because God the Father said, this is my son. He knew that he was loved because God the Father said, I love him. And he knew that he was accepted because God said, in him I am well pleased. He did not need to test God again. Guys, how do you do at not testing God? How do you do at just trusting that you are who he says he are, you are? That you're loved because he said he's loved, he loves you? And that he accepts you in Jesus Christ because he says he accepts you in Jesus Christ? Guys, three questions I want to leave with you this week. And don't just... Don't just read them and write them, write them down and then forget them. Put them right beside your devotional book. Put them right beside your Bible. Pray about them be start, before you start your, your de devotion. Just pray that God would show you, reveal if there's, if there's anything of this in your life and heart. Number one, um, are you trying to prove yourself in any area by simply trying to do the things Christians do? Are you trying to prove yourself in any area by simply trying to do the things that Christians do? Maybe sound the way that Christians sound. Maybe act the way that Christians act. Maybe go to the church like Christians go to church. Maybe, are you, what, area of your, what areas of your life are you trying to prove that you're good enough, trying to prove that you're righteous, trying to prove that you're in by simply doing the things that Christians do? Or are you, as opposed to doing the things that, that Christians do because you're compelled by the, the Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and full of his love to do them. And full of his love to do them. In what areas are you proving yourself or trying to prove something by just 
doing the things that Christians do? And what are your expectations that if you do those things, what will happen? What are your expectations? Will God have to do something for you? Right? If you do these things, then he'll have to do that for me. Is that your expectation? Think about those things. In what areas are you just doing the things Christians are supposed to do? And trying to prove yourself in them. Question number two. Whose 40 does your life look more like? Whose 40 does, does your life look like? Does it look like Jesus' 40 where he just trusts the Father? Or does your life look more like the Israelites going through the 40 years in the wilderness? Where three or four days later you're like, God, do you see what's happening? Are you even here? Do you even know? Do you even care? Why didn't you just leave me in slavery? Four or five days later, God, are you here? Do you even see what's happening? Sure, three days ago, three days ago, God, you provided, but I mean, but that's three days ago. Are you going to provide now? Do you see what's happening now? Are you in charge right now? Can you do anything now? Where are you? What are you doing? Grumble, grumble, grumble. Does that look, does that look like your life? God, you see my finances? God, you see my family? God, you see my job today? Sure, four days ago you did something cool, but today are you even there? Do you even care? Which 40 does your life look like more? Does it look like Jesus' walk of trust and peace? Or does it look more like Israelites? Every couple days, uncertainty, grumbling, complaining. Which 40 does yours does your life look like? And then lastly, do you truly trust that you are who God says you are? Do you truly trust that you're loved and that in Christ you're fully accepted? Question th number three, do you truly trust that you are who God says you are? Nothing more, nothing less. I am who God says I am. I pray this week that as you walk with Jesus and as you walk in Jesus, abiding in him, that your life echoes his no. His no to the temptation of trying to prove yourself and provide for yourself your way. That your life echoes Jesus' no and into the temptation of trying to prove yourself and test God by doing godly things because if, if you do those things, he's going to do that. He has to. That you say no to that. And that your life echoes and reflects Jesus' trust in the Father and that you are who he says you are, that you believe that, that you believe that he loves you no matter what's going on. You believe that God does love you. He sees what's going on. He understands what's going on. He is still in control. And that you believe fully that in Christ you are fully accepted by God. He is pleased with you. And that because of that you live a life full of, of sharing and giving and, and, and pouring out God's love to the people around you. That you engage in those good works that God has made you for. And that you do it wisely in this time. So that the message of Jesus' love and the actions of Jesus' love pour out through us. For we are his hands and feet. I pray that this week you look a little bit more and you walk a little bit closer to Jesus Christ as a follower, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for this message. And I pray, Lord God, that, um, that God, that we would have a good week with you, dis despite the ups and downs, despite even, Lord, death, despite the chaos of a world. God, that we would have a good week because we know that you are with us. And God, that we would be pouring out love, that we would be prophesying in your name. God, that we would be doing, uh, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in your name and that we would be preaching 
that we would be bringing, uh, serving in your name and doing everything that, Lord God, that we can do in your name, but that, God, not that we would be doing that to prove ourselves, but, God, that we would be doing it because we are just so full of love. Loving you, Lord God, full of love because you live in us and full of love for the people around us, Lord God, full of love for the people around us. God, work in our lives. Use us this week for your kingdom and for your glory. God, show us by the presence of your Holy Spirit, speaking to our hearts, speaking through your word, speaking even to people around us. Show us the errors, Lord God, where we're trying to prove ourselves our own way. Show us where we're trying to prove ourselves your way, where we're putting you to the test. God, and show us us those areas and forgive us for those areas. Let us walk walk to you in repentance, Lord, not just relenting, but repenting of our sin in those areas. May we confess our sins one to another as we're called to, and may we find freedom in you, Jesus, from them. God, work in our lives. May we become more and more disciples who make disciples for your kingdom and for your glory, for the salvation of the lost, for filling the heaven full of the people you made. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great week.